Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. In this video, we're very lucky to have a special guest, and that's uh, Colin Cantrell, the founder of Nexus. So, how are you going, Colin? Yeah, not bad. Thank you for having me on the show. No worries, mate. It's, it's my pleasure. So, I covered Nexus recently. It's a fascinating project. You guys have been working hard behind the scenes for a while now. So, do you want to maybe give us a, a quick update of what's been happening lately? So, lately, we're pushing forward on the Tritium interface, which Think of it as a customizable module-based wallet and eventually a module store. And I mean, skins and abilities like that. And then the actual Tritium level, I guess, processing, which what it's going to do is it's going to scale up and speed up the chain and open up a lot of new avenues and create things like trust chat because of the trust system, basically where you have to build up a reputation in the network. It's going to allow other people to interact with people at helps make cleaner chat environments, get rid of certain amounts of trolling and all those other things. And it's also setting the base of the three-dimensional chain, which as you know, is gonna be unlocked in three levels. So Tritium is the first level of it. And uh, one of the reasons we're doing it that way is so that it can actually transition a regular Bitcoin-based blockchain into a three-dimensional chain. So in the future, if other currency projects find it valuable and they'd like to help scale, it'll help the industry as a whole, as well as it'll help Nexus. So there's that on the software levels along with uh, developing and finding new kind of routing solutions on just thinking more the close to the hardware levels as we start moving forward with the mesh networks. So the mesh networks on the ground um, are going to basically allow you a peer-to-peer -peer hardware connection and the satellites up there will allow those mesh networks to talk to each other as well as give you connection when you may not have access to any other type of broadband. And I think that's the thing that ex excites everyone, these cube satellites that are going to be in low Earth orbit that are going to give global coverage and um, really something that's cut cutting edge technology that I'm really excited about, this idea of being able to have a decentralized internet. As you say, you're decentralizing decentralization because even um, Bitcoin now, you know, six companies control 80% of the hash power. So your aim is really to let everyone get involved and contribute to these networks and the ground stations, the antennas, even own a cube satellite possibly in the future, all that sort of stuff. Do you want to maybe talk about yeah. that a little bit, how people can contribute to this network? So basically the way we're designing it right now is you can create a device which would act as a mesh device, so it's to say a client device, which would be able to connect with other specific ground stations and then the ground stations would be talking to the satellites. So you'll be able to run on any one of those layers. Now, when we put the satellites up, we're going to be working on either creating a virtualized environment where you own a piece of space, kind of like a cloud, and the whole network itself kind of works under one where you can actually manage your own specific satellite. So any one of those three stages are going to allow you to contribute and build the network. And that's something that makes it kind of unique and powerful compared to the internet is all of the devices that we build and buy actually work together to build an internet itself. So as I, I guess all the nodes in Bitcoin and Nexus allow to not be shut down, the same thing as with the network is all of the physical hardware nodes work together to provide each other connectivity and you work with each other's connectivity. And it's something that, I mean, everybody in let's say a neighborhood could have that they would all be able to talk to each other, just cell phone to cell phone ad hoc, or you know, create the routers into a mesh network, which for one, cuts down the actual time for packets to be sent back and forth. And then for two, it, it opens up the ability for them to route for other people and then maybe route in through to talk to a satellite. So those are the three areas that people are really going to be able to get involved in, whether it's just starting on the ground or even building some of the technology. Once we open source some of these designs, they could build their own and expand upon it. And I think that's something that's going to really make this really turn out something beautiful. And that, that 3D chain that you're talking about, I don't want to dive into it um, on too much on a technical level, but a lot of my viewers now are pretty familiar with you know proof of work and the miners can do that with CPUs and GPUs um, and Nexus. And then we've got that also, as you said, that new wallet that's coming out um, where you can do proof of stake. And that has that reward system um, of about, is it 0.5 to 3% staking rewards and you can build up your level of trust in the network. And I think I read that the next issue of that Tritium wallet fixes a few of those issues about if you go offline and have to rebuild your trust and all yeah. that sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, the trust system, the, where we're changing it is we're 
integrating into the signature chains uh, as your trust key instead of it just being an actual, uh, I guess we just say an ECC key just to spare the technical details. But the other side is you're going to have a positive trust that's built up and then you're also going to have penalties. And so your total trust is based on the number of penalties. Right now it's just you build up positive trust and the penalty is to lose trust. And it worked well back in the earlier days. Uh, it was developed in 2015 when the network was smaller, but as it's grown, we've kind of seen that it has a few issues scaling. So that's what we're working to mitigate. As all cryptocurrencies are facing these uh, scaling issues. So once this is rolled out, 100,000 transactions per second, and it's all on chain, which is which is really exciting compared to what you know, maybe Lightning Networks and off-chain solutions are talking about for other coins. Yep, and that's I think a big imperative too because the Lightning Network it will enable scaling, but it essentially is just creating crypto banks where people can basically transact between each other in a central authority, and it, it removes a lot of the essence of a blockchain. Now, I mean, it is one method to do it, and I don't want to get negative on other people's implementations, but personally, my principles lie in cryptographic chaining all the way through for all sizes of transactions so that everybody can transact on the network and not have to worry about censorship or worry about funds being frozen or stolen. Yeah, the trade-off is a degree of centralization um, for those that are doing those other off-chain solutions. So um, the final things I'll talk about on a technical level, I guess, quantum resistance. A lot of people are worried about quantum computers. Um, you guys use that um, 1024 hashing. Um, and I think you were speaking about how as quantum computers develop, there's a couple of issues that will arise. It's that reverse um, engineering of the public key. Um, is that my understanding yep. correct? As well as brute force attacks to, to um, solve encryption. Is that correct? Yeah, so, I mean, the two sides are, you basically, yeah, you can decrypt the private key from the public key, right, and find a way to steal people's funds that way. That's the most daunting one. Then the other one is the hash security will basically be cut in half versus what it is now because a quantum computer can essentially exponentially process faster than a regular binary computer. So it's something that needs to be considered and looked into sooner rather than later especially considering that a lot of some of the early Bitcoin transactions and blocks at Toshi Mine were exposed public keys. Yeah. And with a certain number of qubits rendering about 1,700, 1,800 qubits, those keys can start being reversed, which means anybody can steal those coins. And that's a lot of coin. And it's also a lot of, how should I say it, public controversy that could come in and it could really kind of harm the, the public security of it. And proof of work would basically be pointless at that point if the actual private keys and public keys don't remain strong. I think everyone would be going for that Satoshi wallet straight away once this becomes okay. a possibility. Uh, yeah. So, mate, let's dive into the um, the Cube satellite. So, I did a, a few rough estimations. Is it about two or three hundred needed to give good global coverage? Is that a fair yeah, estimate? Yeah, depending or? on what level of uh, you know orbit you're at. Because if you're a little bit higher, like you have Leo, which is low Earth orbit. Mio, which is mid-Earth orbit, which is around like 12,000, 13,000 miles, and then Geo, which is about 27,000 miles, where you would only need four or five. So yeah, a few hundred should be able to get it down there, but we don't want to limit it to just that small amount of cube satellites. We want to constantly be increasing that number and constantly improving on that, and that's where the you know, connection with Vector comes in very beneficial is that we're going to be able to do very large amount of rocket launches per year, which means we'll be able to put a lot of these cube satellites up. And the more cube satellites you buy in bulk, then the cheaper they're going to be. So for those that don't know, um, Jim Cantrell, Colin's father, is, um, is he the founder of Vector Space Systems? Yeah, he's a co-founder with co -founder. John Darby and I think Ken Sunshine and a yeah. few other people. And, uh, it's based off of John Gary's original small sat launch designs, which he developed for about 15 years. So they have a lot of engineering already done into it, which is one reason they've been able to assemble the company so fast and get it to production when it launches next year. So yeah, it's a partnership made in heaven. The the rockets that launch the satellites are the father and son combination. Um, yeah. So I think. When in the initial stages, how many satellites can you maybe put up per launch and you're going to piggyback off other um, launches, not just Vector? Um, once you've got it, maybe a dozen um, orbiting the Earth, that can give a coverage every three hours to send transactions. Is that the sort of initial stages, how it looks? 
Yeah, I mean, the initial, initial stages is, is just getting a few up. Now, Vector having Galactic Sky is going to be something that's going to help with that. But depending on the actual size of the satellite and the capabilities that are required of it is going to depend how many we can put up per launch. I mean, we're going to most likely be buying some rockets and then doing some tests, just piggybacking on some other ones. So, I mean, we're looking anywhere from the range of 60 to 100 cube satellites per launch if we get them in a very small size. So, I mean, there's some cube satellites that are actually the size of just a Coke can or, you know, a little can, which is ones that we're looking into, but we have to make sure that it's powerful enough to handle what it needs to handle. Yeah. So basically, yeah, I'd say a few hundred, but over the course of 2018, 2019, we're probably going to be seeing us getting towards those numbers and closing in on 2020, 2025, we're going to start seeing them probably get into the thousands. That's that's awesome, man. I, I I can't believe this is happening. Like you said, those tiny sixty per launch um, and getting those into orbit. It's, it's just incredible how easy and how fast this stuff is um, is developing. So, um, other questions I had on the list here for you. So, what's some sort of um, any issues that you've been facing or, or competition, and what do you see as the headwinds for Nexus moving forward? Um, I see some of the headwind is a lot of people have been taking the satellite idea and trying to take it as their own and do it in different ways. Um, other headwinds are just, I mean, simply market conditions right now with Bitcoin going on such a run that kind of is more difficult for altcoins to continue to thrive. So, yeah. um, and another challenge is just the designing and the implementation of it and making sure we do it correctly and making sure we have all the financial backing to do it because it's going to be an expensive process but i mean it's going to be something totally doable but it's, it's going to be a while to make sure we get it and the last challenge is making sure that we can make it fully distributed because i mean it's easy to put up a satellite and rent one like blockstream did or put up the satellite that you control or say you know hey i have this satellite up here that allows you to send a transaction to but if it's independently managed and distributed it's going to take a lot more work than what the industry currently is capable of which is what we're working on designing how are we going to get these ground stations to be able to communicate with their specific satellite only be able to control their satellite handle its orbits because you can't just put a satellite up there and expect it to continually work you have to maintain it yeah. you have to make sure it stays in orbit so those are a few of the challenges that we're facing right now so i mean some um altcoins now with market caps let's just use some round numbers of say 200 million and we've got bitcoin now getting up towards 200 billion Billion. So what sort of money would you need and how expensive is it going to be um, per launch or per satellite if you need, let's say, 200 as a round number again? Have you got ballpark figures of what you'd like your market cap to be and how much this is going to cost? Well, it'd probably be good to get a real large volume. We'd probably want our market cap up from where it is now, probably closer to the billions. But I mean, in order to do a few simple launches now, it'll cost the the funny thing is the cube satellites the easy part and the launch is kind of another easier part for us but the more expensive part is the personnel costs and the operations costs of the satellite yeah. so just putting one or two satellites up is going to be inefficient compared to putting up a swarm so yeah. i mean a vector rocket is about a million and a half and i mean depending on the bulk price we can maybe get the set size down to like 20k 30k especially if we build it ourselves in a clean room so, I mean, I'd say it's probably going to be close to two or three million to get a swarm of at least one launch up there, yeah. especially the personnel costs yearly. And then from there, though, it'll become easier and cheaper. It's just that first step forward is where the most expenses come from. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that pushback you got to start off with was that this is just a pipe dream. This is, and then I think it's very inexpensive. I think this is very realistic. It's just finding the right people and... and um, yeah. A matter of time until this is rolled out, and in my opinion, mate. So, um, where where's your ultimate um, vision? So, where would you love to see this going in five years' time? Is everyone using your decentralized internet now instead of their local um, internet providers and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, what I'd like to see in five years, for one, is you know the positive culture emerging further and further, which is one thing I really like about our communities. We're all about the positive movement, changing the world for the better, distributing things further. And I'd like to see the networks kind of open source and being developed and growing. It may not be all over the world just yet. It takes some time, but at least growing and moving and then satellite launches more consistently, the three dimensional chain active and running on its relays and uh, the continued progression of this new technology. And 
a, a positive movement moving forward in the world around these idealisms. If, you know, let's create something to bring us great. Let's not worry so much about these monetary gains that we can have, which I think a lot of focus on cryptocurrencies. I think a big thing for me, at least that drives me forward, is making sure that we can make the world a better place and utilize these technologies for the betterment of our freedom and our liberty, rather than you know the detriment of it, which can kind of happen. It, it can go either way, depending on really what our intentions are of the process and the growth. Yeah. And as you said, the, the money side of things and the price of Nexus isn't necessarily your focus. And there was a lot of hype built up um, into that meetup during the year, um, the conference. And I think you guys are working hard behind the scenes. You're not the sort of team that want to pump things up ahead of time. When these goals are met, I think we're going to see an increase in price. And as long as more people use Nexus in the future, the price of that token is going to um, increase and allow you to expand more so and even faster in the future. So any closing comments, mate? Um, I mean, I guess I could say thank you for the interview and I appreciate it. This is a, it's going to be a good interview. It's a little mellower than some of the other ones and yeah. a little more relatable. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And I mean, just the final comment is, you know, uh, look into it and uh, see if the intentions align with yours, because we're really about kind of bringing people together and connecting people through technology. And I think that's something the world really needs now, especially in some of the conditions we're seeing. And so just, you know, keep positive and see if it's something that, you know, I guess resonates with you, if it's something that you appreciate, if it's something that you see, because I mean, there's money is a byproduct of what we do. So there's always going to be plenty of that. But if we don't do it for the right reasons, and we're going to end up seeing it turn into something that it was not designed to do. Satoshi designed Bitcoin to help free us. And now it seems like we're turning Bitcoin into the same type of banking system, just with a little more advanced protocol. So I mean, the intentions that we have now are very important. And I think it's good moving forward to assess that and realize are we here to just make money or are we here to make the world a better place because there's a, a greater fulfillment in making the world a better place and there's a greater joy in it and if you'd like to be a part of that definitely come and uh, join up and see how you can help contribute yeah i think yeah internet neutrality and all those things are going to be huge issues moving forward so i think you guys are going to be solving a real world problem you got a fantastic team your values are very much um, in, in line with mine. And a lot of people, you, you guys are pretty popular here in Australia. I'm not sure if you realize you've got a decent following here. So um, keep up the That's good awesome. work, keep up the good work, mate. And I really appreciate you um, coming on the channel today. So thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. Cheers, mate.